Hello, everyone. Um, this is our first online lecture. This is Chapter 11, Part 1, Rotation and Torque. Um, some of this we've actually covered before, but we're going to go over it again. It's Section 11.1 .1 through 11.4. Um, a really quick note, this week we're going to cover Chapter 11, uh, which is Torque, Rotation, and Angular Momentum. Next week, we will cover chapter 12, and then we're gonna have some review and a bunch of problems, and we'll be ready for exam two, which is in a couple weeks. Um, I'll send you an announcement, more on that later. But for now, we're going to quickly go through the first half of chapter 11. Um, it's a lot of little concepts on how to deal with rotational motion, and it's probably the toughest material that we have to cover. Um, I will also be uploading today a second video called Chapter 11 Problems 1, which focuses simply on two really tough problems um, that I want to take you through. They're definitely stuff that will show up on an exam, stuff you need to know. So. Um, this is mostly information, a little bit of derivation, a little bit of problem solving. That other video will be really rigorous problem solving. Okay, so let's go to translational motion. So the first thing that we need to remember that we're talking about is for, say, a block. Um, if we have some mass um, that is a that is modeled as simply a block and it's moving to the right with some velocity. That velocity we refer to as translational velocity. Um, we can model this as if all the mass is at a point which is the center of mass of the block and that point moves with velocity center of mass in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction. Um, this is all familiar, we've done this all semester. Um, but the main point here is that every single piece of mass in that solid object moves with the same translational motion. So we usually call this v of x or v of y or v of z and the normal equations um, v is the change of x over the change of t, et cetera. I think you all understand that. Um, but the reason why we're reviewing it is there are very, very striking dif differences between translational motion and rotational motion. So when we have a disc or a wheel, let's say we have some disc and it's rotating about its center of mass, the problem is that each little piece of mass here can rotate with a different speed. Um, let's take a really quick look at that. Imagine that you have a point that is on the outside at a distance r. And this point during one rotation okay, goes around an angle 2 pi. Um, but we know that it has to travel the full circumference of this object, and the circumference is 2 pi r. So imagine that it does this rotation in three seconds. And so we would know that the translational velocity, the velocity of a point tangential or translational, um, tangential to the radius is the circumference 2 pi r over three seconds. Um, and that would give us meter per second squared. Um, however, let's look at a second point. And the second point here, imagine, is at a radius of half um, our full radius. So the distance this guy has to travel is 2 pi times r to the half, or just pi r. And we see that the ten, translational tangential velocity of 
this point or this mass would be pi r over three. So it would have half the velocity. And the main point here is that different masses travel at different velocities while rotating. Um, and so we need to come up with a different set of mechanics to deal with that. We can't just say that everything moves with the same velocity. What we can say, however, and it's the next slide, is that everything moves with the same omega. Um, imagine again, our two points, each of these points is going to travel around and subtend an angle of two pi radians during one rotation. It's the same for both of them. So they have an, the angle over the change in time is what we call omega or our angular velocity. Um, so each of those points has the same omega and therefore we have to change to different variables, um, different quantities to measure rotational motion. Right here, I'm showing in this picture, um, in order to have something that we can actually use mathematically, we assume that solid objects like wheels or disks will rotate with something called rolling without slipping. And what that means is as it rolls along the surface, there's no force that's making it speed up or slow down. And rolling without slipping in simplest terms means that as it travels, translates to pi r in the x direction, it rotates through a full rotation. And from what you see here, the change in angle is half pi, then pi, then three half pi, then two pi. During that time, it travels half pi r, pi r, three half pi r, or two pi r around the circle, around the circumference. So rolling without slipping is another way of saying that it travels two pi r in the x direction, and a point on this surface rotates a arc length of two pi r around the circle. That being the case, we get this equation right here that says basically change of x is what we call s or the arc length is equal to r theta. Um, I left off the delta here, but it's understood that we mean the change of s is equal to r change of theta. Um, r in the case of rolling without slipping has to be constant. Um, so that gives us these conditions. r constant. So we have to have a constant radius. We have to, um, a point travels a distance around, distance of two pi r, whatever the radius the point is at, um, while the object <clears throat> translates um, a distance of two pi r. And that gives us that S is R theta, okay? Um, now from these conditions, we develop the equations of rolling without slipping and we'll use them constantly but you can see here that if I take the time derivative of the arc length holding r constant I also take the time derivative of the uh, angle theta what I get is that the tangential velocity is ds over dt and the angular velocity is d theta over dt and so from this, I see that I get Vt is equal to R times omega. I can take the time derivative of the translational velocity and the time derivative of omega. And again, I get that dV dt is equal to A. And I get that d omega dt is equal to alpha. Now, A is the translational velocity. 
it's not the radial velocity, it's not V squared over R, it is just the acceleration along the curve, along the arc length. And d omega dt is the change in angle um, per time squared. So what we see here is that we also get A of t is R alpha. So I'm gonna write these up here. Rolling without slipping implies that the arc length S is equal to R times the theta, that the tangential velocity is also equal to R times omega, or the angular velocity, and the tangential acceleration is R times alpha. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, I think we've covered that many times, but we're going to use those, and you'll see later, those are gonna be the bridge between the various equations that we have so that we can solve for acceleration or velocity and find the position and describe the motion of any particle or system that we have. All right, so a few quick notes um, that are kind of neat, maybe non-intuitive, um, but this is going to lead to a key point. So let's imagine that we have a wheel and it's moving to the right, okay? And a point at the top is therefore moving with translational velocity v, a point at the center of mass is moving with vt, and a point at the bottom is also moving with vt. This is only the translational motion, okay? But then if we look at how it rotates, assuming it's rotating without slipping, we also get V of rotation at the top. We get no rotation at the center of mass. Um, that's because the center of mass is on the axis of rotation. And at the bottom, we get V of rotation heading in the opposite direction of the particle at the top. So the thing's spinning around, this is rotation. Um, a side note, remember that when we have rotation in the clockwise direction, this is negative alpha and this is negative omega by the right hand rule. If you curl your right hand, your thumb points in the positive or negative direction. If, it's, if you hold your hand in front of the screen, your thumb point at you, your fingers curl to the right or to the left, I mean, um, that is counterclockwise, that is positive. If you have to turn your hand the other way so that your thumb is facing into the screen, your hand would curl to the right and that's negative. Um, so here we have negative rotation. The wheel or disc that's rotating is rotating in the negative direction. But the important thing here, the super important thing to notice is that what if we put them both together? And if we put them both together, and I drew it off the ground just so you can see this, I would have VR and VT for the top point. The center of mass only gets VT, and the point that's in contact with the surface has V rotation and VT. And so what we get, and this is the important point, is that because VT and VR are the same, Vt is equal to Vr because it's rolling without slipping. Um, then the point at the top is actually moving with two times the velocity of translation or rotation. The center of mass is only moving with one times the velocity. And this point that's at contact is actually zero. Um, it might seem that this is a mathematical construction, but I assure you it's not. Um, there's a picture, at least maybe not in our book, but you can see pictures on the internet of wheels that are moving off the ground. And at the top of the wheel, the spokes are blurred and they're clear at the bottom. This is equivalent to how in um, projectile motion, at the top of our motion, the velocity was zero. So momentarily, the point in contact with the ground is at zero velocity. Um, it's, it doesn't have a lot 
of use for solving problems. It's kind of a curiosity. But the one thing we will say about it is, in order for something to rotate without slipping, there has to be a force um, mediating it. And so there's a force that is actually pushing um, on the, the um, object to keep it rotating. Um, and that force, which is causing the rotation, is going to be in this direction. So we're going to have some static friction force that is pushing that way um, to make the wheel rotate. That's going to be important later. Um, but for now, just note that there's a static friction force. It's only causing rotation. It's not leading to any work done. It's not stealing any energy from the system. It is merely um, converting rotational or translational motion into rotational motion. Um, that's described pretty well in your book. Um, as I said, it's more of a curiosity. We'll see how it works in a minute. But um, before we do that, we need to talk about torque, and then we're going to talk about yo-yos, and then we'll get to how that um, frictional force actually helps cause rotation. OK, so let's go back and talk about torque. Um, just real quick. Imagine that we have some thin rod, a uniform thin rod, rotating about one end. And if we recall that the moment of inertia about that was m times the length squared over 3. And if we apply a force here, and because we're going to want numbers later, let's just say it's a 20 Newton force, and that this whole thing has a length of one meter, okay? That force, because it's acting perpendicular to the radius, actually creates a torque, which creates rotation. And our mathematical definition of torque was the cross product of R cross F, okay? Here, well, and before I say that, which means that we get R F, sign of the angle between R and F. And here's a really important point with torques. In order to figure out what this torque is, we draw our R vector, which is equal to L. And then we draw our force at the tail of R. When you do a cross product, you put your two vectors tail to tail, and then you rotate R to F. So my question here is, is this a positive or a negative rotation? By the right-hand rule, I see that this is a negative alpha. By the torque equation, I note that R, F, sine of the angle between R and F, that this angle between R and F is negative 90 degrees, or it's negative um, pi half whichever way you want to do it here. So R, F, sine of negative pi half. When you have signs with a negative in the argument, the negative can come out. So sine of negative theta is equal to negative sine of theta. And so our torque here is negative R, F. Um, and so we can write that the torque here is negative L times our force. Torque is equal to I alpha, the moment of inertia of the object times the angular acceleration. Um, note that the units here are Newton meters, but they're not energy yet. In order to be energy, we need to multiply the torque by the angular displacement. It's just the torque. It's, it has units of Newton meters, but they're just torque. Um, really quickly, we could find alpha for our block. Alpha, um, oh, one other thing I should note, this gets a negative sign because alpha is in the negative direction. So we have negative LF is equal to negative I alpha. So alpha is equal to LF divided by I. That is um, our one meter 
times our 20 newtons divided by ml to the third, squared to the third. Um, let's do two kilometers for the mass. So this would be two times one squared over three or two thirds kilogram meters squared. Um, divide this by two thirds. And what we get is we get 60 divided by 20, which is 30 rads per second squared. Um, pretty simple. But the main takeaway here on torques is that you have to put them tail to tail and then define the angle between them and you get that the torque is RF times sine of the angle between them. Um, I would say 80 to 90% of the time our torques are going to be 90 degrees off each other. They might be positive or negative, but they're 90 degrees off. We'll go over that more in chapter 12, actually, and a little bit next time, but um, more in chapter 12. For now, they're almost always going to be 90 degrees. So just remember that that's how we define torques. We're going to go over it more in a minute. Um, the first problem that I really want to do is I believe section three or four in the book. It is the yo-yo. And the yo-yo is actually a really nice, simple angular acceleration problem. Um, so if you don't know what a yo-yo is, what a yo-yo is is it's two discs um, with a string and you tie the string to your finger and you let it go and it falls down it, and then it spins its way back up and you can do tricks and all sorts of stuff but for us we're going to consider a yo-yo to be a round disc with a center of mass and then at some little r we're going to have a tension pulling up on it and it's going to accelerate downward the whole system is going to accelerate downward um, should also note that this whole yo-yo has a uh, radius of big R, okay? So now the important stuff. Um, we handle this exactly like we handled the blocks on inclined plane type problems, except we're going to have to have a torque equation, and I'll show you that. So first of all, just imagine the yo-yo as a point mass. Um, it, of course, has to have a weight, mg. And it's got this tension from the string, even though it's offset by R. If we look at the whole system and we imagine the whole system as a point mass, uh, we have a tension. I'm going to choose, your book chooses A to always be up. I don't like that. I'm going to choose my A to be down. Remember that I always told you, I always told you I wanted to see A in your free body diagrams. It has to be there so that you can write the correct. Um, Newtonian equations. Don't forget A. You'll get counted off on it on a quiz or an exam. Um, it's super important. You have to decide for yourself which way A goes, and you can't change it, and it has to be consistent. And that's going to get us to our next part. So this is our free body diagram. We simply put the forces off to one side. We write what direction we're considering the positive acceleration to go in. But our torque diagram is a little different. We draw the center of rotation. The center of rotation is the center of the yo-yo. And then we draw all the torques on it. So here I have this little r, and I have this tension upward, okay? And then I usually draw a second diagram because I draw my little r and my t tail to tail. I know that I'm gonna rotate this way. I know from the right hand rule that clock or counterclockwise rotation is positive alpha. So this torque is positive. Okay. So we have a positive rotation. We have a um, torque, this torque. The only torque on this is RT and it's going to be positive. And that's all we need. Okay. We've done everything um, we need. The answer that we're looking for is what is A of the yo-yo once it starts to descend from the string. Okay, So let's go to the mathematical description. I'm going to redraw these free body diagrams. So remember, I had a tension. I also had a weight, mg. And I decided 
that A would be down. The Newtonian equations for this are MA, since A is down, MG is positive, and T is negative. And now I need, if I have some kind of mathematical description of T or an equation that I could substitute in for T, I could solve this for A and I'm done. So we go back to our torque equation, and we had little r and t, and we know that this is rotating positive alpha. So our torques, the sum of all our torques is equal to I alpha. And so we get that I alpha is equal to RT. Simple enough. Well, not quite. We need to solve this for T, which that's pretty easy. But it would be better if we had this, if we had A instead of alpha in here. We don't know what alpha is. So this is where we come back to our rolling without slipping. When we have rolling without slipping, remember that A is R alpha. So we can plug in for alpha A over R. Okay, that says that when this thing is rotating, A is equal to R times alpha um, at whatever point we're finding the tangential acceleration. So let's write this I over R times A over R. And we see this is IA over R squared. So I get that MA is equal to MG minus IA over R squared. Combining like terms, MA plus IA over little r squared is equal to MG. Um, I can divide through by M. And then I get that A times one, if I cancel that, I get one plus I over MR squared is equal to G, or the final solution, A is G over one plus I over MR squared. Now note, there's one big note here. I is m r squared over two for a disc, big R, the full radius. Um, this R is the R where the string is actually um, unspooling from, okay? So, um, so we have, little r, big R, okay, big R is the full radius, and we have that our A is G over one plus I M little r squared, if we use I is M big R squared over two, then this would become G over one plus big M over R squared, M R squared over two over M R little, r squared, that would be big R squared over two times little r squared. Um, I'm not gonna plug numbers in for this, but a couple things to note. Your book writes this with a negative sign. It says this is negative one plus i over m r squared. Um, another thing that your book talks about, a little bit about how you have to be careful because of the negative alpha and the positive x and blah, 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 blah. Um, it's important to keep in mind your alpha. We're going to talk about that more in a minute on these inclined plane problems. But I want to show you one side note on this. Um, if I were standing on the opposite side of this yo-yo, uh, meaning I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so let's say instead of a positive rotation, I now have my little r here, big R is here, and my yo-yo is going to actually rotate that way, and this is negative alpha um, as it falls with A. So looking at, we still have MA is MG minus T, assuming that A is down, um, 
And for our torque diagram now, though, we have R and T. And this we see when we rotate R to T is negative alpha. And what we write here is that the sum of the torques is equal to I times negative alpha, right? But this torque is actually negative as well. It's R T sine of negative 90 degrees or negative pi halves, which is negative RT. So this is also negative RT, and therefore we get I alpha over R is our tension. We get the same answer, and we better get the same answer um, that we got before. There's no weird negative sign happening here. That part's a little more subtle. Um, it's really easy to forget that you need to put negative alpha and the negative torque, and therefore you get a positive um, alpha in your equation. Just be aware of that. But um, it's not too tough, I don't think. Anyway, so moving on. Now that we have that, we can talk about masses on inclined planes. The reason why I wanted to wait is I have to add that static friction. So let's imagine that I have some mass. It's sitting on an inclined plane, a plane inclined at some angle. I perhaps have some length and I have some height. And what I want to know is if this object can roll down, I want to know what the acceleration at the bottom is. So going back to the same way that we do all of our free body diagrams, we still have a normal and we still have this weight coming down. Um, but we also, at the bottom of the surface, have this weird static friction force, which is allowing the object to rotate. Without that static friction, the object couldn't rotate. If it was an uh, inclined plane of ice, imagine a bowling ball would just slide down without spinning. Um, if there's no friction, it's not going to rotate. So as before, we draw our free body diagram with a normal force, a weight in the y of mg cos theta, and a weight in the x of mg sine theta. And then we have a friction force. I don't want you to write f is equal to mu n here. Don't do that yet. Just assume that it's an unknown friction force that's causing this rotation. But what have we forgotten on this free body diagram? What's the most important thing? We're going to say it's going to accelerate down the hill, okay? Down the hill. Now, this object is also going to rotate. So this object is going to have a torque acting on it. And that torque is going to act at a distance r and be due to the static friction force, okay? that's going to push it so that it rotates in the positive direction, just like when we originally talked about this. This force is actually causing this rotation. This force is acting at the point of contact where, remember, there's no motion. Um, so this force is simply causing rotation. It is a torque. Let's draw it tail to tail and figure out what the torque actually is. So the torque is rotating from R to F, always R to F, is R, F of static friction times sine of the angle between them. The angle between them is 90 degrees. So this is a positive, and this is equal to uh, I alpha, okay? So let's go here and actually look at these one more time slowly. The free body diagram for the inclined plane, part of this was N and um, <clears throat> mg cos theta, mg sine theta, and a force of static friction. And then the last thing that you always have to put is A, okay? The torque diagram is R 
F static friction. You though you have to put this tail to tail, so R and F of static friction. The rotation is that way. By right hand rule, we know that this is a positive alpha. R is rotated positively to the force of static friction. So on our free body diagram, we write alpha. I don't necessarily need you to put this part here, but your torque diagrams had better have all the torques and they better have alpha clearly listed and showing that it's positive, okay? Right. So let's go. Lastly, from those, um, we get that MAX, remember, this was MG sine theta, that was pointing that way, and force of static friction. I don't care about the Y right now. Um, it simply, well, I can write it, but MG cos and normal force. Um, this is going to be mg sine theta because mg is pointing in the same direction as the acceleration minus the force of static friction. MAY is zero and it's the normal force minus mg cos. However, we don't need that right now. Um, we're gonna leave that alone for now. Then we have our torque diagram where we have R, F, Fs and it's rotating positively. So we have that I alpha is equal to R F of static friction. Solving this for the static friction force, we get I alpha over R. And again, since alpha is A over R, we get that I A over R squared. So we can plug this right in there and we get that M this A is actually our AX. Um, MA is MG sine theta minus I AX over, uh, let me erase that X. I don't need this X here. Okay, and then solving this for A, we get that MA plus I over R squared A is MG sine theta. Dividing through by m um, and getting a by itself, we see that this is g sine theta over 1 plus i over m r squared. So just divide through by m. Um, canceling all those out. Remember that this is 1 and you get this this right here, uh, shoot. This right here is your equation for the acceleration down the inclined plane of a rolling object. Your book, again, inserts a negative sign here. I'm not putting that negative sign. Do you know why? The reason why is I clearly defined A to be down the incline. In your book, they always define A for some reason to be up the incline, and you just have to know that. I prefer you guys to just be consistent with your acceleration. If you're declaring A to be down, you better get that A is positive. Obviously, this is positive. There's nothing negative in this equation. Um, we're going to do an example using real numbers um, and show you how it works. But other than that, it's pretty simple. This is almost a plug and chug thing. If you remember this on an exam, I don't expect you to write the rest of this. Um, it's a well-established derived equation. But we'll talk about that more later. So a solid sphere rotating down an inclined plane. I'm going to assume that a solid sphere, just as a preliminary, has a moment of inertia of two-fifths mr squared. Um, so I want, and I'm going to go the opposite way. Um, I'm going to say that this is 20 meters. And I want to know 
If this solid sphere starts from rest, I want to know what its velocity, v at bottom. Okay, it seems a little hard, but it's actually not. Um, even though this is rotating the opposite way when it goes down, um, our negative alpha, and so I, negative alpha I, will end up being negative R force of static friction. Let's look at that. Um, the force of static friction will be here, R will be here, and so our torque on this system, and it will be rotating in the negative alpha direction. Um, if I put them tail to tail again, I get that my torque is negative I alpha, negative because alpha is negative, is equal to an R F sine of negative 90 degrees, which is again negative R F. Putting that in, I get that I alpha is R F static friction, which is just what we found before. Um, okay. So let's look at the solution. If our mass is five kilograms and our radius is 0 0.5 centimeters, um, I believe that's all we need to know. Um, uh, we do need to know the incline of the plane. And let's say the plane is inclined 30 degrees. Okay. So our solution is that, as we noted, A is G sine theta down the plane, down, incline, over one plus I over M R squared. As we said before, I for a solid sphere was M R, two fifths M R squared. So we get G sine theta over one plus two fifths m r squared over m r squared. So A is G sine of 30 over 1 plus 2 fifths is 7 fifths, which is 5 sevenths G sine 30. Let me do that really fast. Um, uh, do, 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 do. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, everything good. Sorry. Um, one times sine of 30, I get this is 3.5 meters per second squared. But that's not what I wanted. What I wanted to know was what V was at the bottom. And I said that it traveled um, 20 meters down the incline. So our delta X along the incline is 20 meters. We know that V final squared minus V initial squared is equal to 2A delta X. If we assume that this A is constant, we are going to assume it's constant in most problems. And because we start from rest, zero, rest, we get that V final is the square root of two times A times delta X which is two times 3.5 times 20. And that is uh, square root of 140, which is 11.83. So we get 11.83 meters per second squared. As a follow-up question, what is the angular velocity that the sphere is now turning at. Um, so, um, what is omega final? We know that omega initial was zero because it started from rest, but what is omega final? How would we find that? Going back to here, um, our V final was 11.83. So if V final is 11.83 meters per second, we know from the rolling without slipping condition that R omega is V, therefore omega final is V final over R, which our R we said was half of a centimeter. So we get 11.83 divided by 
which is um, 23.66. So 23.66 rad per second or radians per second, which is pretty simple. Um, make sure that you always kind of have that in your back, back pocket that you know that. Um, this is pretty much all I wanted to go over as far as the material in the chapter to start with. Um, just know how things rotate, remember how to do torques, and how torques cause rotations with mechanical, um, in mechanics, and the equations that we use. I'm going to do two really hard problems as a second video, as I said, um, to further go through it. However, I wanted to break the two videos up because that's going to be a lot of math. I know this is a lot of math, but um, it's, it's pretty math heavy. It's deceptively simple. So um, I figured I'd give you guys a chance to rest after <laughs> looking through this. Give yourself a chance to recharge, grab a drink, and then sit down and see if you can get through the two much tougher problems involving all of this fun stuff we just learned. Um, all right, last thing I wanted to talk about was concepts and equations to remember. So make sure that you remember your rolling without slipping, um, that you have V is R omega and A is R alpha. Remember that this is the arc length. So when something goes around a curve, we're talking about V, we're talking about A in that direction. R is constant in rolling without slipping. Um, and that these are really the bridges between the two. Uh, remember that for a mass on an incline, we get G sine theta over one plus I over M little r squared. Um, for the yo-yo, the angle is 90 degrees, so you just get G over this. And then the direction of this is determined by um, which way you chose positive. So um, make sure you choose positive in the right direction, obviously. Um, and remember that there is this force of static friction, but it doesn't really do anything besides cause the rotation. Um, I guess the last thing to remember is that when an object can roll, uh, motion is partly um, translation and partly and part rotation. And that's why when we did the kinetic energy of rotation, we had mv squared over 2 and we have i omega squared over 2. We're going to go through that when we do these problems. We're going to revisit that a little bit. Um, and of course, we'll revisit it during the review. So um, anyway, uh, that's all I got right now. I'm going to have chapter 11, part two, as a little bit of foreshadowing. Chapter 11, part two is all angular momentum. It's concepts like the conservation of angular momentum, the reformulization of Newton's laws having to do with angular momentum. It's our final conservation law that we're going to learn in a class. Well, I, I believe it's our final converse conservation law. And then uh, there's a really cool uh, part of the book on gyroscopes. And I find gyroscopes really neat. You might want to, if you have nothing better to do, uh, look up YouTube videos on gyroscopes. Check them out. They're pretty neat devices. And we're going to talk about mathematically how they work. So anyway, I uh, hope everyone's happy and safe and healthy. Hope all your families are doing well. Um, can't wait to see you all again. I don't know when that will be, but uh, good luck. I'll post some homework later this week too, and I'll talk to you soon.